Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help executives become better cyber risk managers. We are your hosts. I'm Kip Boyle, CEO of Cyber Risk Opportunities. And I'm Jake Bernstein, Cybersecurity Counsel at the law firm of Newman Duors. And this is the show where we help you become a better cyber risk manager. The show is sponsored by Cyber Risk Opportunities and Newman Duors LLP. If you have questions about your cybersecurity related legal responsibilities, and if you want to manage your cyber risks just as thoughtfully as you manage risks in other areas of your business, such as sales, accounts receivable, and order fulfillment, then you should become a member of our Cyber Risk Managed Program, which you can do for a fraction of the cost of hiring a single cybersecurity expert. You can find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. So, Jake, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, Today, Kip, we're going to talk about threat intelligence and how that differs from technical cybersecurity and why it is important for reasonable cyber risk management. Okay. Uh, So, sounds like we're going to dive deeply here, Um, uh, but I'm interested, right? So, um, okay, so let's start uh, by telling me, you know, what... um, what is threat intelligence? So threat intelligence is is a lot more than just a uh, a vulnerability feed. Right now, when when you you see threat intelligence, it's a it's a kind of sexy phrase. Lots of people like to use it. Oh and yeah. A lot of the time, what they really mean is threat is a threat intelligence feed. In other words, uh, you know, a nearly just a, a drip or sometimes a, a fire hose of data uh, that's really automated mm. and and is so that like an RSS feed kind of? Almost like an I was gonna I was actually thinking an RSS feed, almost mm. like an RSS feed. Um, but that is not threat intelligence. That is a uh, that is a technical and useful component, and it, it can tie into a SIM or a SOC, and we should probably define what we yeah. mean by those. <laughs> Definitely. SIM, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking SIM about is, all the CEOs out in the world that are listening yeah, to our podcast. Me too. The what now? <laughs> yes. Uh, so a SIM is an S E I M, which stands for um, Security Information Event Management, and a SOC is S O C for Security Operations Center. And they right. are—they're not identical, but you know. You, well, they go together, right? They, so, go to, they go together. So Security Operations Center needs to have a way to know what's happening, right? They need kind of a radar screen, like, you know, what's going on? And a SIM is a way to do that, right? It's aggregating data feeds from routers and switches and firewalls and intrusion detection systems, endpoint monitoring systems, right? So in very, in very well done SIMs uh, that are driving the, the intelligence of, of security operations center, that's kind of what's going on. But I mean, a, uh, a, a company, you know, that is say less than a billion dollars of, 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 of revenue a year, if you're, if you're under that threshold, it's not likely you have these things, right? Right. And it's not necessarily clear that you should have them or that if you did have them, that they would be helpful to you. Right. And, okay. And so uh, conveniently, that ties directly into what threat intelligence really means, which is understanding the the world of possible threats to inform your overall risk management strategy. It is much more of a intelligence analysis in the CIA sense, in mm-hmm. the spy world, mm. than it than it is about a uh, a, a technical uh, you know a technical operational plan, and you know technical cybersecurity, what we mean is the SIMs and the SOCs and the firewall rules and the IDS and the IPS and, and all of these different, uh, you know, network engineering type things, which are really important. The problem is, how do I know what to tell my fancy intrusion detection system or intrusion prevention system to look for? Mm-hmm. Or how do I know what to set my firewall to reject or, or block? Yes. I don't know what the threats are. Right. Okay. So and, good. So it's kind of like saying, um, I, I get a, uh, you know, I, I get a patch notification. Uh, okay. So Microsoft says this patch is like, you know, uh, top of the heap, like deploy it right away. But how do I know that I'm actually that, you know, that, 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 that severity rating applies to me, right? It's generic. That's, it's generic. And, and where it gets even more important and interesting is, is so, you know, threat intelligence is, is knowing 
what the threats are, how they operate, where they come from, whether you're likely to be a target, and kind of everything surrounding that human-based intelligence analysis. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's so important is that it's very easy to get caught up in news stories or, or vulnerability right. announcements. Yep. But if you don't, if you don't have, if you don't have the, the, if you don't have the organizational ability to intelligently assess and analyze those reports, you could end up spending millions of dollars defending yourself against something that is unlikely to ever happen to you. Right. Yeah. So a good example of that is in the news recently, I saw a warning that the FBI put out that said, hey, in the next few days, this weekend coming up, possibly, uh, we know there's going to be attack against uh, some banks and the attackers are going to try to uh, hijack the ATMs and have them spit money under the ground so that their money mules will be able to scoop up all that cash and make their getaway. And so, um, so that was a really interesting alert because if I'm not a bank, if I don't have automated teller machines, I don't have to really worry about that, right? And so that's a good example of a highly targeted piece of information where it's very clear whether that uh, particular threat uh, affects you or not. But most of the stuff we hear about, it's not that targeted. It's not. And I think and you bring up a good, a very interesting point, which is one is what's the difference between information and intelligence? And I, and I think that, you know, those are information and intelligence. You know, the, the term intelligence has military connotations. It is, it's from the spy world. Right. Uh, but it is, I think what's really interesting is that as cybersecurity becomes a industry level concern, not just military, not just government, not just critical infrastructure, these terms and the training that people get from spy agencies is trickling down into industry and it becomes yeah. necessary to have people who can do this type of threat intelligence right. analysis. That's because it, it, it's be, another way of saying that is it's, is it's becoming relevant to know who's after who, right? Because on the internet, we're all targets, right? But we're not we're not all targets to the same attackers. Some attackers are going to specialize in certain types of targets. And so, for example, if we know that, uh, you know that the Chinese are looking for information related to certain technologies and you're a company that possesses those technologies, then, okay, great. Now you've got some intelligence that says that you could become a target for Chinese hackers. Um, but if, you're, if you don't possess that kind of intellectual property, then, you know, then you probably don't have to worry so much about the Chinese this year. Exactly. Exactly. And that is the essence of threat intelligence as opposed to, you know, I, I, what people have called the threat intelligence feeds. Really, mm -hmm. that's just a pipe of information. Yeah. Right? And you've got to just... sift through it and figure out what's applicable to me. And one of the, one of the real challenges here is that, is that automation and uh, uh, particularly with the buzzwords of machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, are all are all the rage right now? Right. The, pr the problem is is that is that in the term the term of art intelligence, it it, it is you it must have a component of analysis from a thinking being and and for all the talk about artificial intelligence, it, it's really nowhere close. No, <laughs> <clears throat> no. I mean, um, you know, artificial intelligence can do some really interesting things, right? So um, people, maybe, maybe you don't realize it, but if you use um, a Gmail and, uh, and you've got the Gmail app on your phone and, and you get a message from somebody, you can see there are some suggested responses that are starting to show up now, right? Where you can, uh, somebody says, well, hey, I just want to let you know X, Y, Z. And you could tap, oh, okay, thanks very much. And, and just respond with that. And that's artificial intelligence, right? That's, that's Google's algorithm searching the message you just received and then saying, hmm, I wonder, you know, I wonder if I can serve up three canned responses that the, that the Gmail user could choose from. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not. And I've got to make a decision, right, as, as the receiver of the email, are any of these uh, appropriate or not? And if they're not, then I have to disregard them and, and actually, you know, sit there and type out my own response. But, you know, that's kind of, you know, a, an example of, of how artificial intelligence is showing up right now. But, the point that I want to make is that just like they don't always get it right on what 
the responses are that I really want to send. And so there still needs to be a human being looking at what is the artificial intelligence suggesting. And a human being needs to be able to say, yes, that's right. Or nope, that's way off. And I'm not going to follow that. Exactly. And I think one of the, one of the, um, one of the pitfalls that I think a, uh, of an organization with with strong technical cybersecurity can easily fall into is this notion of well if all of my blinky lights are working and all of my rules are set up then i'm doing really well and they don't necessarily pause to apply the their own human intelligence mm -hmm. to the problems and i think that really what we're talking about here is learning how to create actionable intelligence yeah. what do i do with this, you know, you've given me information. I can, everyone, there's so much information. Yeah. Right? There's an, an unlimited deluge of information yep. that you and can. And the AI machine learning people think <clears throat> this is great because uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, feeds off of large, you know, uh, quantities. It, it does. It totally does. So, so it's helpful in sifting, but in order to make actionable intelligence, you have to have properly trained personnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where it really comes down to. And, and I think that, that, you know, there's, there's components of threat intelligence, uh, understanding, identifying risks, having an adversarial focus, uh, and then learning how to apply that knowledge to make critical decisions is so, right. is very, very important. Yeah. And, and a good example of that is, is to understand and fight against your own biases. And, and here's a fun example, you know, talking about the, uh, the WannaCry virus, right? Mm -hmm. It only targeted Windows 95 with a certain flaw, right? Well, Windows you know, 95? Was it WannaCry was WannaCry, not, not Petya or some of the, uh, those later ones, but the WannaCry virus was, uh, it was, it, it, cause Windows 95 is still used by a lot of people around the world. Well, right. I know it's I know it's used a lot in the in the medical industry, right? As um, like as the mach as the computer that drives the MRI. It's it's also used in a lot of countries that never paid for it. Ah, right. Okay, right. great. So it's so so the user base of Windows ninety five, despite the fact that it is over, you know, gosh, twenty it's over twenty years old. Mm -hmm. You know it's still being used a lot. Right. So you know this WannaCry virus spread and and did all this damage. Well, you know, maybe Microsoft did that, right? To, to, force, <laughs> to force an upgrade. So that, maybe, maybe they did. But I think where you're going with this is if you didn't run Windows 95 in your company and you knew that, then WannaCry isn't really a threat to you. Uh, there's, well, I have, I have two points. That's one of them. The other point is nobody thought that because nobody assumes that Microsoft or any legitimate company would ever do that. Right. Right? Yep. But isn't that a little bit like saying, well, the British are our friends, so they'd never hack us either. Like, you see where I'm going with this is that, yeah. is that, is that true threat intelligence training helps you learn about these biases right. and to fight against them. Yeah. You, might, you might think, you know, a more realistic example, and by the way, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that Microsoft did want to cry. Okay. Well, thank whoever you. Is, the, whoever thank is you listening. Disclaimer. To it, that was meant <laughs> that, that was meant to be an instructive point. <laughs> here's a, here's a much more realistic example though, is let's say I'm a, um, I'm a company in the U S and I have, uh, I have some intellectual property, but I just, it, it doesn't seem realistic that the Chinese government or the Chinese military would be interested in that. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's a that's an inherent that's your bias you're right. making a you're making a, you know you're potentially misjudging your threat landscape because of your own bias of your own value judgment the fact is is that you shouldn't assume that right. anyone's not going to be interested in your ip and in fact i would probably argue and i'm curious if you agree if you have any kind of valuable ip you should probably think of yourself as a target to, oh, more, yeah. to more than just the random hacker gang. Well, yeah, 
So this goes back to, you know, a conversation we have all the time with people, which is, you know, movies and, uh, and, and, and TV shows are completely misinforming you as to the, the true nature of the threat on the internet, right? It's not the lone hacker sitting in the basement of their parents' house, you know, uh, you know, looking for targets of opportunity. I mean, the real issue here is you've got nation states and you've got cyber uh, criminal gangs. They're operating at scale and they want money or they want information that they can turn into money or they just want the information because they want to uh, advance their national agendas, right? And so, um, and so people are biased to not think about that stuff um, because the popular media that they're consuming um, and the advisors that are, you know, talking to them are, are generally not, you know, mentioning this stuff, at least not in the, you know, in the middle market in yep. a small, uh, small business space. I mean, I imagine that, you know, the very, very large enterprises, you know, in, in the nation, right, very large banks, large aerospace manufacturers, automobile manufacturers, that sort of thing, they're probably pretty well, you know, tuned in on this, but yeah. I'd say most of, of the market is not. And so that's kind of, that's part of our mission here with this podcast is to help people recognize, you know, what's really going on out there. But just to circle back to your point, Jake, um, yes, there's a bias and artificial intelligence and machine learning and threat intelligence that can all do good stuff in terms of, uh, of, of informing you, you know, of where your bias is and, uh, and to sort of counteract for it. When I was in the Air Force, we talked about intent, right? In other words, um, we said, what is, you know, uh, or, or I'm sorry, not, we, we looked at intent, but we also looked at um, capability, right? Mm -hmm. So we would say like, well, the British, uh, you know, are our allies or the Australians are our allies or whatever. Um, but, you know, what, what capabilities do they have? If they decided that they didn't want to be our buddies one day, what could they do to us, right? And so we had to develop playbooks to anticipate what if, of a, a current friendly nation becomes a hostile nation to us, right? What, what can we expect? Well, and, and, and so that, that is helped us think about this. And that is exactly the same mindset that's necessary for threat intelligence. I mean, it is threat intelligence. It and, is. And what you just said is so funny because people might, you know, there's not that there, there's not that big of a difference between thinking, well, what if Microsoft did this on purpose versus, well, what if the British or Australians suddenly become an enemy, right? Both of those seem to the average person silly. Equally <laughs> equally implausible and silly, yeah, but yeah. yet the military still spends time and energy coming up with contingency plans for those what ifs. Yeah, well, and I think you also have to be careful with these what ifs too, because you know if if you run amuck with this stuff, you know if you let your imagination run wild with you, and you actually start telling everybody, you know, hey, we better be careful because you know the instant that so and so turns on us, you know, uh, they're going to do all this stuff to us. I mean, I think um, you have to be really careful with this stuff, right? You it's, can you can get overly paranoid, and that you becomes can get wildly paranoid you can yep. become a cassandra right you could be yep. you could be saying things to the point where people are stuffing their fingers in their ears and saying stop you're you know you're spouting nonsense you've gone too far i can't rely on you as an advisor um because you're in some la la land right exactly so you, you have and, to have and, a lot of discretion and that is why threat intelligence training is so important because there's so many ways that you you can either it's you cannot do it at all, which is a big mistake, or you can go wildly too far off the rails, and that is equally big a mistake. Right, right. And, and so, you know, there are, like, you have to do this stuff. And it turns out, like, for example, our Internet Age of Criminals presentation that we've given, that mm -hmm. actually is a threat intelligence training, yeah. right? Yep. It is. And, and it is, uh, it's, it's important to learn that stuff and and the funny thing is is that this isn't an impossible thing like you don't need to go to cia school right to learn how to do this and you don't even have to get very sophisticated right you no. don't have to buy a uh service that's giving you artificial intelligence or machine learning you don't need that no. um, all you really need is you need to get a, uh, a reliable uh, feed of, of intelligence and uh, and you just have to think critically right I mean if you can just do some negative visualization you know like think about um, like when you read about a threat and and ask yourself well could that happen to me and if it did you know what would that be like and just just doing that very simple exercise each day for five minutes or something like that or sit down once a week for half an hour um, can can do wonders for you uh, as compared to doing nothing it is and and you know i i want to you know i stopped picking on microsoft for a minute because i i i think they're just a great company and it's totally fine 
but where an example of where that type of thinking is is actually probably very important is insider threats. Yeah. Right. Because oh, yeah. Because there's a lot of you know there's a lot of potential risk there. That how do you how do you quantify that or qualify it? Like how do you even begin to know? Yep. And and a trained threat intelligence uh, you know uh, analyst that's one of the things they can help with. Right. I mean, and we, and you, you know, we talk about on the geopolitical uh, stage, this idea of what if our ally becomes our enemy, right? Are, are we prepared for that? Have we thought about that? <clears throat> well, the insider threat is, is conceptually the exact same thing. But I've applied hired, to the, exactly. Yeah, I've hired somebody, they're an ally, they're helping this company move its agenda forward, this organization move its agenda forward. But what if one day they become disgruntled? They were gruntled and now they're disgruntled. What, what could they do to me, right? If they yeah. just start acting contrary to our, you know, uh, to what I thought was, you know, somebody who is going to push my agenda forward. And, uh, and so, you know, tremendous damage can be done. And there's many case studies of insiders, uh, you know, going rogue. Uh, so, yeah, so that's a great point, you know, of how to use threat intelligence as a way to think about uh, insider threats. That's great. Yeah, that, and that's I mean that's one of its key uses is to is to be able to defend yourself against those types of threats. And it's I mean threat intelligence is 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 a it's a way of critical thinking. It's something that yep. it's something that uh, that I recently discovered that that we lawyers do all the time without ever having labeled it threat intelligence. Oh, right? interesting. When I when I review a contract, uh, what am I really doing? But I'm I'm actually thinking through all the different ways that things could go sideways and how the other side might use this language to mm. argue against me and for their position. That is a form of threat intelligence, right? It just so happens that the threats are legal threats as opposed to right. cybersecurity threats. Right. But it is the same mindset. Mm, it is that same same kind of critical analysis yeah. that goes into it and the asking yourself what if and, and having that adversarial focus. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that I want to uh, also point out for our listeners is um, something that you mentioned earlier uh, in our conversation, which is, um, is that artificial intelligence, machine learning is uh, all the rage now in terms of products and services that you can purchase uh, to deal with your cyber risk. And I think it's important to take a moment and, uh, and really uh, focus on that because um, there, there are always uh, trends in the cybersecurity space. And I've seen this over and over and over again. Uh, when intrusion detection was, was an emergent thing, all of a sudden everybody had intrusion detection capabilities, even though yesterday they didn't, all of a sudden today their product does, and everybody tries to position to be able to say, yeah, we do that too, right? They're all hopping on the bandwagon and, and, and trying to reposition themselves to be able to say, you know, we've got that. And, and the truth is, is that um, from, from my perspective, there are very few products and services out there that you can buy that are offering genuine threat intelligence capabilities or genuine artificial intelligence or genuine machine learning differences. And, uh, and I would encourage our listeners, you know, if you're considering a product or service Service that's offering any of this trendy stuff really dig into it and, and ask the the you know the sellers you know come on really walk me through this and show me you know down down uh, down that you know give me the ground truth on this is this yep. really is this really you know, how exactly does this work how exactly does it does it help me because um, these buzzwords are, uh, are, are are really doing a disservice right to they, the, they the really few, are to the few, uh, you know, uh, organizations out there that are probably offering something genuinely useful. But this really goes back to something I studied when I was in college, which was I was interested in artificial intelligence. And at the time, uh, the current thinking was that artificial intelligence would actually provide, uh, once it became, you know, feasible, um, a decision support system. So in other words, it, it wasn't really thought of as, well, machines will make decisions. It was really thought of as a human being will have a machine assistant and the machine will make suggestions 
or will provide insights that the human being, uh, you know, wasn't at, as quick at, at gleaning for themselves or maybe perhaps would never be able to, um, you know, devise those insights yep. because the data sets were just too huge for yep. a human brain to comprehend and to sift and to sort. And I still think that that really is, is the ideal model. That's what we've been talking about here is, well, this, I, is this idea that it, it takes a human being, but with the, with the assistance, right, of some yep. kind of a machine learning capability. And, and that's actually in the marketplace and they have names, Cortana, Siri, Google Now, uh, Alexa, all of those personal artificial intelligent assistants do exactly that. They're, they don't, you know, yes, they have voice recognition capabilities, but if you go, if you dig in a lot of, particularly with Google and, and Cortana, a lot of what it's about is, is anticipating what you might want to see next right. and doing that based off a lot of data and number crunching and and you know they're they're useful in doing that right now a good example is siri or or google now surfacing a card for you about the traffic conditions at the time that you usually right. for work right yep that, <clears throat> that is a that is a practical, and it might seem mundane, but you know it's only mundane in the context of 2018. <laughs> you know, the idea that a phone could automatically learn when you leave for work and timely give you a traffic report just in time for you to leave yeah. you know, in 2010 even would have been mind blowing. Yeah. And, and that's super helpful, right? I mean, it's a machine super helpful. saying to a human being, Hey, I'm going to surface some information for you that you probably weren't aware of. And I'm going to help you make a decision. And maybe the decision is, Oh crap, I got to skip my second cup of, cup of coffee at home because the traffic is horrible. And now I've got to hit the road yeah. earlier than I or, thought. Or maybe it's I take the back roads instead of the highway. I mean, it's, right. that's exactly the point, and that's totally correct. Right. And so, you know, there probably are products out there that can do something similar for threat intelligence to, br to bring it full circle to our, yeah. our topic. What I would like is like is a nudge from a machine that says, hey, I noticed that on your network you have this kind of computer. And I also noticed that this morning um, the maker of that computer just released a firmware update that is uh, cybersecurity relevant. You should check on that. And that, that would be ideal. And, and, and then I want to, come, want to make sure that we mention you know, remember that for our listeners, remember that true threat intelligence is a training issue. It is the application of, of a human brain to a problem. Right. And, and that no matter how much artificial intelligence and machine learning you throw at it, the best that you can hope for, at least in the foreseeable future, is this assistant type of component. Mm -hmm. You still need to have someone who's been trained. And, and I want to mention this because I think it's really important. Let's talk about what reasonable cybersecurity is. We've talked about it a lot. What is reasonable with respect to threat intelligence? It's not expensive. It's, it's you know, getting someone some extra training or reading a book or-, right. or and there's a lot of free data There's a lot there of free data feeds, right? So to me, that indicates that, you know, if, if you haven't thought about this, if you're not making use of threat intelligence, yeah, you probably need to start doing that because you know, and I say, I think a simple way to do that is <clears throat> if you could just get your um, your vulnerability notifications tailored for the systems and software you use so that you don't have to look at vulnerability notifications for uh, systems and software you don't use. Yep. That would be a great first step. That would be a great first step. I totally agree. It would be very easy to uh, to then get that in place, see how useful it is, and then just kind of build on that, right? Iteration, um, that's really a lot of what we recommend to our customers is, you know, don't try to big bang any of this stuff, whether it's, um, you know, artificial intelligence or any of the other things we've talked about. <clears throat> you want to start modestly. You want to build something that works, and then you want to iterate and you want to build on uh, build on it from that. Well, I think that's about wraps it up, Jake. Any last it thoughts? It does. No, I think uh, I th I think that we had a uh, a really important conversation, helping people understand the difference between technical cybersecurity and and threat intelligence as a training yep. a form of thinking, and uh, I you know. And how those ideas relate to reasonable uh, cyber risk management, which is a big theme for us, right? We always want, always want to yep. try to bring uh, back to that. So, um, well, great. Thanks, Jake. See you next time. See you next time. 
thanks everybody for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport and needs to incorporate management, your legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. And management's goal should be to create an environment where practicing good cyber hygiene is supported and encouraged by every employee. So if you want to manage your cyber risks and ensure that your company enjoys the benefits of good cyber hygiene, then please contact us and consider becoming a member of our Cyber Risk Managed program. You can find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.